Libby Frank comes from Framingham and is an active member of the New England storytelling community. She grew up in the Midwest, her mother a storyteller in the 1920s and 30s, reared Libby on storytelling. Libby noted that she had a vast repertoire of stories and she also created special stories just for Libby. And that was her beginning experience and connection to the storytelling world and she thrived very well and goes forward and presents her stories at conferences. She hosted the award-winning Cricket Corner on Natick Cable Television and also hosted Outspoken Word Series for Amazing Things Art Center. She tells stories, myths, folk tales, and also uh, invests a great deal of time and research into bringing strong, daring women of history to life, some including Lady Agnes Franklin Hopkinton's own romantic heroine from the 1700s, as well as Dr. Miriam Van Waters, Julia Ward Howe, and Dorothy Parker. When asked what was one of her most powerful moments in sharing a story, just recently Libby noted she was uh, sharing a story for a Yom Kippur event, and she found the children, perhaps a different audience than when she speaks of daring women of history, were all spellbound by that story that she had to share. Libby has a CD of her own and always a new story to share. And when I asked her about the importance of sharing our stories and our art with community, she said, why share? We are all wired for story, and it is one of the most powerful forms of sharing what it means to be human. And here to share stories with us, perhaps about being human today, we have Libby Frank. Please give her a warm round of applause. The Ghosts of Pratt Street Palace, 45 years at number 39. It was 1969. My husband and I were expecting our first baby, and we needed a house. So we were going to meet the realtor in downtown Framingham. Now, the ad in the Globe had said, Colonial. But as the car rounded the corner on Pratt Street, we gasped, that's not a Colonial, that's a mansard Victorian. <laughs> the tower loomed up in the twilight. As we went through the house, we were not deterred by anything, not by the six little children in two bedrooms, not by the linoleum on every single floor, not by the TV in the bay of the living room, or the freezer humming in the dining room, or the statue of the Virgin Mary above the soapstone sink, or Grandpa in the back. The details of the Second Empire had us mesmerized. A real fixer upper. We were game. At the closing, when the house was transferred from the Baxters to the Franks, Mrs. Baxter said, We were always very happy in that house. What was ours, and Herb was the perfect person to take care of it. He was a model airplane builder, and he had carpentry and wallpapering, and he added plumbing and electricity to his skill set. My parents, who were so excited to become grandparents, named it the Pratt Street Palace. <laughs> now, I um, was lying in bed one night, and I'd just been told that I was having twins. So I announced out loud to what seemed to be the heart of the house, to the stairwell, if there are any ghosts here, they will have to help take care of the babies. <laughs> no ghosts appeared, a powerful exorcism. They arrived on March 8th, Thomas Hamilton and Allison Robin, and I had to take care of them without the aid of spirits. Well, maybe a few spirits now and then. <laughs> now, a little of the history. 1870, the brothers, Esti, Constantine, and Alexander owned the land, and it was surveyed by Charles J. Frost. 
1876. As Herb used to say, when Grant was president, it was built for Edna Inman and her husband Hiram. And then the Inmans sold it back to the Estes, and in 1884, the Estes sold it to the estate of Charles J. Frost, where it was held as rental property for 60 years. And workers lived there who worked at the Denison, who went off to fight in the Great War, and then the Charles J. Frost estate sold it to John and Angie Breda and their three sons who fought in World War II. And the Breedas sold it to the Baxters. Now, the first room that we renovated was the bathroom. And my mother said, my goodness, a house built in 1876 was built with a bathroom? We didn't have indoor plumbing till 1915. She was from the Midwest, so they were a little behind the time. The next room that we did was the master bedroom, and we painted it red, white, and blue to match a model airplane that was hanging from the ceiling. And when you were lying in the bed in that room, the bed shakes when the trains go through downtown Framingham. Well, the tower room with the three distinctive windows, that was the nursery. And her built a wonderful window seat toy box, which could also be a tunnel with little doors at each end. And the window sills and the doors were painted orange and green and red and blue and yellow. And Tom had a red crib, and Allison had a blue crib. We had a Dutch door there. And and once we noticed the cooperation of the dynamic duo, there was a little rocking chair, and Allison had pushed it over to the half door and was holding it while Tom stood up and peeked over it. And then the cribs were replaced by twin beds. And every night, Herb would announce, bedtime for Thomas and Allison, all of the producers. And they would put their feet on the pillows and giggle and say, come kiss us, good night. <laughs> and then the twin beds were placed in the bunk bed configuration to give more room on the floor for toys and books. Now, the downstairs living room, that was started out as Herb's workshop. He had a great big power saw in the middle of the room, and the neighborhood kids found out that he could be coaxed into helping them build model airplanes. So he would supervise the apprentice modelers, pinning their wings and tails and rudders on the floor while renovating the house. The dining room floor was where Tom began his wrestling career at the age of two months. An old friend came and took this tiny little baby boy and pinned him to the floor. He said, I might as well do this while I still can. What foreshadowing that was. When I stand outside the house and look up, I see all of the people who climbed on the roof. Now, a proper Second Empire house has a cornice between the first and second floors, but it had rotted and was ripped off and replaced with tar paper only in place around the tower. And Herb recreated it, batting out brackets on his bandsaw. On a warm April day, he climbed up the ladder, ready to nail some of the brackets in place with his back to the street, and suddenly there was a great weight on the ladder behind him. It was Mr. Breda, who'd grown up in the house. He was a carpenter, and he was climbing up to see what was going on. He said, hey, looking good. When I ripped off that cornice, I never thought it would come back. And her built a garage to match the house with freshly minted Victorian trim. Now, in the front hall, there's a beautiful curved stairway and a newel post. Now, when Tom was about three, he woke up in the middle of the night and got out of bed and went to watch some TV with his dad. And it was a movie, and in the movie, he saw a little boy slide down a banister. His eyes lit up. <laughs> he had no idea. He couldn't wait to try it. Now, Allison was golden-haired, 
and blue eyes. And she was very enthusiastic and loud, but she always sang a perfect pitch and adored performing. Tom was, had auburn hair and brown eyes, and he loved to climb. He could climb up the door frame, a la Spider-Man, and then he would lurk on the top on the other side to frighten people as they walked through the doorway. I would bring home books from my elementary libraries in Natick, and at 4.30 in the afternoon, we would sit in the unmade bed, and I would read to them, Allison on one side, Tom on the other. Hey, who says books can only be read at bedtime? Downstairs, in the living room, the living room became a proper Victorian parlor, and the workshop was put in the basement. And every year, there was a 10-foot-tall Christmas tree in the front bay, and train tracks that went around the tree with an engine that was so big that the kids could ride on it, pulling freight cars filled with presents. Now, between the living room and dining room, there was a great big double arch, and that was, of course, a theater. And they performed and costumed many plays for us. And it was also there that they began to um, rehearse audition pieces for, for plays that they were trying out for. Tom found material very quickly, a Bill Cosby routine or, or Snoopy monologue, curse you, Red Baron! Allison agonized over the choice of her material. Oh, maybe Violet Beauregard's monologue from Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. I'm a gum chewer, actually. Oh, no, maybe, maybe poetry. There, where the sidewalk ends. Now, our dining room table. That was where model airplanes were built. Of course, we ate there, too, but it had many, many functions. And Allison had this wonderful little Polish doll, and it broke. The arms and legs came off, and, and she walked up to her father, and she said, can you fix it, Daddy? And Herb looked at the Polish doll, and he said, well, I guess when the Pope came to Boston, she just fell apart. <laughs> and he took rubber bands and reattached the legs and arms and went back to sanding a propeller. The music from our dining room sound system filled the house. Judy Collins, Peter, Paul, and Mary, free to be you and me. Allison sang along with Broadway, and Tom listened to Rocky to get him pumped up for his wrestling matches. The high ceilings made the house seem cold, and every time the heat would go on, Tom would run to the heating duct in the dining room and sit on it for hours hulking out of his jeans during his seventh grade growing spurt. And Allison got a room of her own, and her father built her a magnificent closet, pink wallpaper, pink floor covering rug, and an army of teddy bears. She sat in front of a full-length mirror on a door, and she fought with her hair, which had suddenly turned curly, and she was getting ready for a seventh grade bat mitzvah, and she was screaming at her kinky hair, and her brother said, you, you are the antichrist. <laughs> and then we had um, many works on um, Tom did indeed do wrestling. He got, oh, he took over the, the tower room. That was his kingdom with dinosaurs and monsters and art supplies and a great big desk uh, rescued from a deceased Natick School library. And he was ready for high school. He liked South High. He played soccer. And he walked home with Mike Connery, who told him all about the wrestling team. I'm one of the captains, said Mike, and you know we need freshmen. If you can cut the weight, you might be able to res wrestle varsity. Well, Tom did. Every year, freshman year, 114. Sophomore year, 121. 
junior year 128, senior year 134, and he got better and better. <laughs> the promise on the dining room floor when he was a baby certainly came true. And we weren't the only ones who appreciated his, his wrestling. Mr. Brita attended many of the matches. And his son was also a wrestler, and he said, that Frank kid is really good. You got to try harder. And when Tom won the States, beating the Wayland wrestler at Wayland, Mr. Brita was there. They graduated from high school. Tom went off to the University of Michigan, where he was a sculpture major, and Allison went to Syracuse to major in musical theater. And the great trek went straight west through Canada. But still, every year, there was the Christmas tree in the bay in the front. And during college, uh, Tom unwrapped a present, and it was this big cape to keep the winds of Ann Arbor from freezing him as he walked about campus. And, and he confessed that he was going to perform some comedy routines at the, at the college comedy uh, event called Laugh Tracks. And, and he tried out some of his material for us. You think that's funny, Tom, said his helpful sister. <laughs> and then. We repapered the hall for the second time. When we came in, it, it, it was all these flowered wallpaper, and, and then it was replaced with elegant gold and white stripes to match gold-flecked mirrored tiles next to the stairs. And then in 1991, we did it again. We had a gold and salmon-colored patterned wallpaper, and the woodwork was gold. And it took four people to do the one run. We were all home on July 4th when the tiger lilies are in bloom. And Herb brought in an outdoor ladder, and he put sort of mittens on the top of it. So as he leaned it up against the wall, it wouldn't hurt the wall. And, and he'd built a sort of a platform that he could stand on while he put the wallpaper up. And Tom held the ladder down at the bottom. I held the ladder at the top, and Allison handed him his wallpapering tools. Jesse the cat prowled the hall. Meow, said Tom. And there, suspended 12 feet above the stairs, Herb got the giggles. And the echo of his belly laugh is held in the hallway in the stairwell where his portrait, done when he was 26 years old in his James Dean period, <laughs> guards the house. Well, after college, Tom went off to LA to do comedy and art. And Allison went off to a regional theater in Memphis. And in November 1991, I was clearing off the dining room table of all the model airplane stuff to get ready for holiday meals. And as I swept up the, the balsa wood and the tea pins and the tissue paper, I said out loud, the model airplanes will never come back. Why did I say that? I was not going to banish them. I would never banish them. In December. 1991. I was preparing for holiday stories to be told to the Natick Rotary, and I was modeling a new outfit for Herb in the kitchen. As I spun around, he said, oh, the sheen of the boots and the silk of the skirt. In the backyard, there was a great elm tree which was rotting away, dropping its branches with every storm, every hurricane. It was as if nature was saying, watch out. Living in that house was like living in Neverland. Herb was like Peter Pan, and I was Wendy, telling stories to the lost boys. And Peter was building me a lovely house. But then our Peter Pan flew away. Herb had a terrible staph infection, which had invaded his heart on the last day we all got ready to go to the hospital, and I went to our copy of Peter Pan and found Peter's quote, to die 
will be an awfully big adventure. And Peter flew away. At the funeral, I wore that outfit with the sheen of the boots and the gleam of the skirt. And the kids flew back to their lives in L.A. and Memphis, and I was alone in the house, and I watched the sunlight pouring through the huge windows, fearing, filling the great rounded spaces of the bays. Well, there was another Peter Pan. Rick Breda, who was the descendant of the Breedas who'd lived there before, came and helped fix up the house. And as he tightened the screw in the newel post, he said, hmm, I slid down that banister many times. I guess I got to fix it now. And he brought in his crew of lost boys, and they helped work on the house. And then I took up with Captain Hook. <laughs> I met retired biologist David Engel. And he wooed me with ballads of Captain Kidd and Staggily, and he awakened my inner pirate. And we did many programs together of history, stories, poems, and songs. And on May 15, 2005, 39 Pratt Street was the hit of the Framingham History Center's house tour. And it just happened to be on Herb's birthday. But then there was more tragedy. David died in 2006, in the same month, in the same hospital where Herb had died. And I was swindled out of my inheritance, and I had to rent out the back of my house to make ends meet. My first tenant was great. He worked nights, and he had a lot of books and some turtles. But every month, that rent check slid under the door. But after him, oh my goodness, I had a drunk, a druggie, and a deadbeat. And I said, I quit. And I decided to sell the house. I must tell you about some of the royalty that has lived there. Of course, there was Prince Tom and Princess Allison, but there were also family members. The Princess Julia from Hawaii, and my granddaughter, Princess Miranda. And now the house is going to belong to Jack and Shana McKay, who are expecting their first child, Princess Amelia in an old house. All the timbers know their owners. All the stones of the foundation remember events which happened there. The roofs recollect the history of the changing generations. There is not a nook, but it resounds with the comedy and tragedy of life. The setting of the home Every slope, every path, every gable, every stone in the wall is part of memory's picture. Drifting to the top of the debris unearthed on moving day, a frog, green plastic, 18 inches tall, one side bashed in. Scrawled across its chest in bright red nail polish, slightly blurred, you are enchanting. <laughs> From the corner of an almost empty cupboard, I disinterred another gift. Small white china mug cupping a bullfrog within its ceramic walls. When I drank my milky coffee, its knowing eyes peered up at me, emerging from the murk. Its giver thought himself a spellbound prince, trapped in the semblance of a toad. My role was to kiss and make him well. He desired a princess who never would tire, never question or rebuke. When the world grew real around him and enchantment faded, he grew squat. Envy corroded his skin. Other damsels could not find the magic words to free his prince inside, who sickened and then swiftly 
died. Now I am left on moving day to find a home for a plastic frog and the small green beast which lurks at the bottom of my cup. Thank you. This morning, a different kind of quiet, and the first snow of the season feathers the dark edges of the driveway, leftover mums and ornamental grasses, now all a pale dust white. I know there are suddenly impending turkey dinners and the question of gravy. Too much time now for pondering the plausibility of gifts, dutiful visits, the eventuality of a tree strung thick with tiny white lights. Already non-stop holiday songs are playing on all three radio stations. But here, the scarred kitchen counter remains. There's oil and Velcro, a half-burnt jasmine scent candle, and that crescent-thin mark on my cheek, one that I never remembered to show you. Also, the miniature replacement harmonica arrived, and so tell me, how am I ever supposed to look at that moon again when I never learned how to play it in the first place? How can I want just what I have? How does anyone, when there's no getting over anything or taking anything back, tell me, please, how does anybody ever keep going, testing eggs or choosing a movie, making the day's trip to the gas station or dry cleaner, when the world is fist hard and frozen, when wind keens at the window, and I tell myself that this is what I've chosen, and it's already snowing again. and pear apricot then 